Okay, I have just started the recording the session. Okay, I think we can start. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here today and welcome to our second LED seminar of the year. Uh, this, this seminar is entitled The New Digital Education Policy Landscape from Education System to Platform. For those who may new here today, just a quick introduction about the LED seminars. And LED seminars are a series of seminars that are aimed to open a discussion on the latest development and research in the field of labor, education and training. And we uh, organize this seminar one per month. Typically, we adopt our hybrid format. Of course, today is uh, an exception given also the fact that uh, the speakers are participating from the US. I, before starting with the presentation, I ask you uh, if you could uh, turn off uh, your microphones during the presentation and then after the presentation would be time for a discussion and questions for, from you. So I think now we can um, start with, uh, with the seminar and uh, I hand over the floor to Romina who is, uh, will introduce today's uh, speakers. So thank you. Thank you very much, Alicia, and welcome also from my side. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Romina Kakia, and I currently lead the Digital Education and Skills team here at the Jersey. We are very happy to have Christopher Cobo, Axel Rivas, and Niels Kirsten to present to us some of the findings from the book, The New Digital Education Policy Landscape from Education System to Platform, that was published in 2023. Uh, the topic of this book is of high relevance to our work since at the GRC with the research to support policy making, specifically, specifically in our team in digital education and training and also digital skills. So it is a pleasure for us to listen to the editors and authors of this book to present it to us. Without further ado, I would like to present the, the speakers and also thank them for making the time to share their work with us. So we will have with us uh, Cristobal Cobo, who is, who is a senior specialist in education and technology in the World Bank. Additionally, he serves as an associate at the University, at the University of Oxford's COPE, Center for Skills, Knowledge and Organizational Performance, and holds the position of senior fellow for the Inter-American Dialogues Educational Program. His work has garnered attention from major media outlets such as CNN, Deutsche Welle and Le Monde. Then we also have Axel Rivas, who is an associate professor, researcher, and dean of the School of Education at Universidad de Santo Andres. He's also the academic director of the Santo Andres Center for Applied Research in Education. And he's also the author of a few books on comparative educational policy. And finally, we have Niels Kersen, who is an assistant professor at the Department of Media and Cultural Studies at Utrecht University. 
uh, and one of his research areas, the platformization of primary education, public values at risk. And without further ado, I give the floor to Axel. Thank you. Thank you, Romina. And it's a pleasure to see you all. Thank you for joining. And I want to thank the, the European Commission Joint Research Center for organizing this webinar and for giving us the possibility of presenting the book, The New Digital Education Policy Landscape, uh, edited by Routledge. I also want to thank uh, all the stellar authors that contributed to this work from different countries and contexts uh, all over the world, uh, particularly Niels here uh, present as one of the authors. And uh, uh, of course, Cristobal, we had many conversations over the years. And I think this, this book uh, was born out of those conversations. What we found is that in recent years, uh, a new field of uh, digital education policy has been developing. Uh, this new landscape operates under the logic of platforms and it's advancing with the pace of innovation fueled by the private sector and under the risk of uh, privatization and commodification of education. Um, that's why we call the book from systems to platforms and i wanted to deepen the contrast between these two con concepts educational systems are in some way knowledge distribution circuits that cover an entire territory under the flag of a nation they are compulsory from an age that ranges from uh, five to 16 years old with uh, some variations by country. Education systems are strongly regulated by, by the state and seek to war guarantee rights. They are controlled, closed, homogeneous circuits working at a very slow pace. That's why it's very difficult to change them. And they try, at least they try to guarantee some sort of national identity. On the other hand, platforms are decentralized and commanded by large multinational edtech companies. They act according to the logic of the commercial market. They are dynamic, interactive. They have a constant uh, organic growth from interaction with users mediated by algorithms. And they also generate micro incentives and measure behaviors all the time. They are fast, open, and personalized. So this new scenario of new logics and ways to distribute education and knowledge opens many questions that this book seeks to answer. Some of them, only a few of them, are related to what is the role of educational policy in, the, in this, this new stage of platform-based digital technology? What is the balance between national education policies and the increasing relevance of big tech educational solutions? And where is the evidence that learners will learn better, faster, or more efficiently using these platforms? And of course, is AI going to play a game-changing role in this new landscape? And who and how should create these platforms? This question is probably at the heart of the book. Could these platforms become new solutions for expanding the right to education? And how will they transform the pedagogical and sociological codes of learning? So these very large questions are at the core of the book. And we propose to answer or try to answer at least from different uh, fields, crossing different fields and authors. And this is why we like to think this as a frontier book. It proposes a conversation between education and technology, the public and the, the private sector, implementation and reflection, also 
as we say in the introduction, curiosity and action. And it's also a conversation between North and the South with chapters from all over the world. And because it's a frontier book, I think we also had to organize it in, in two parts, which are very related, but at least in, in some sense, we differentiate the chapters that are more empirical and, and, and based on case studies and the chapters that are more essays and, and, and reflections. The first part, we will listen today to the words from one of the authors, Niels Kersen, from who, who will introduce us to the world of platformization in the Netherlands. Uh, the first part of the book also has chapters regarding the digital landscape uh, in India. Uh, the case of the Plan Seival from Uruguay, written by Miguel Brechner, the main leader of the public national platform of Uruguay during many years. So it's very interesting to have uh, a key actor from the sector. Uh, we also have a chapter from Latin America related to education management and information systems in the region and a chapter re related to the World Bank Open Learning Campus in developing countries. So it's very diverse in, in styles and, and, and roles from the authors, which are in, in, in some cases the, the main actors of, of the, the case, and in some other cases they are researchers. The second part is more open to, to discussions and reflections. Vannerman and colleagues analyze the concept of educational access and equity in the era of educational platforms. Grimaldi, Moll, and Peruzzo explore how platformization is related to a growing market of uh, changing economies and uh, also a moral economy that is going into the educational sector. Autopolos, a colleague here from Argentina, explores the different geographies of platformization in the Global South. Frances Pedro from UNESCO writes about the process of platformization in the higher education landscape. Uh, I have a chapter and the final one it has the master uh, signature of Cristobal who finishes the book with a chapter that I will leave him to describe, of course. Uh, having the pleasure to have him here in the floor. This uh, Frontier book uh, appears at a time when fast algorithmic, uh, algorithmic consumption uh, rule our minds and thoughts and manipulates them. A book has the power to capture, we hope, a deeper knowledge and open conceptual reflections on the changes we are living. It's not a tweet. It's not. It has another logic, and and we think that this logic has. Uh, it's it's needed in the present time. So we we hope that a book is not going to become obsolete too soon, but it will remain as part of an a different kind of discussion that covers the, the purpose of going into classrooms in universities and discussions around different uh, hallways of education. We hope it will be useful for different readers who are working in this frontier field of digital education policy making. And we hope we hope to contribute to a more meaningful and diverse conversation on this emerging topic and saying this very introductory words, I will give the floor to Niels to talk about the first chapter of the book. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Axel, for the invitation to, to speak here and for the invitation to uh, to to call all for a chapter for this uh, for this important book. I will now try to share some of my slides and then have a 10 minute presentation about that particular chapter. If anything, if you, if you didn't see it or you didn't, cannot hear me, please let, let me know. Um, if all is well, you can now see my slides. Yes, now it's working. Yeah. You can see the slides. Great. Okay. 
Um, so the title of the presentation is the platformization of primary education in the Netherlands, which is also the title of uh, the chapter, uh, which I co-opted with uh, Professor Dr. Jose van Dijk uh, for this uh, for this book. Um, so my name is Niels Kersens. I'm assistant professor at Utrecht University um, at the Media and Cultural Studies Department, and I have a, a, a research project going on uh, for three years. It's almost finished in this this August of this year, which is focused on exactly what this title already describes. Um, so in this brief talk, I will uh, focus on two conflicting approaches to building digital education ecosystems in primary education in the Netherlands and how this affects the sovereignty of schools to organize their own digital learning environments. And the first approach I will talk about uh, originates from the Dutch public education sector. And the second approach originates from large global tech companies. Uh, and also good to know is that this study is situated in the, uh, the Dutch context and the Dutch educational system. And there's maybe three things are important to understand about that system, also in relation to digitization. First, schools enjoy uh, a large amount of autonomy when it comes to the organization of learning, uh, which also includes the organization of their own digital learning environment. Uh, second, uh, the Netherlands is known for its high degree of cooperative organization. So schools are represented by different kinds of cooperatives and collectives, which represent them in all kinds of ICT related issues. Uh, which also sort of uh, defend and promote their interests and values uh, in these issues. Uh, and thirdly, uh, schools uh, use many different kinds of digital education technologies, applications, and platforms, which include those produced by big American tech companies like Google Workspace and Microsoft Teams, but it also includes all sorts of other digital learning and learning management systems, uh, including systems for personalized learning, analytics dashboards, uh, learning tracking systems, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so that's very diverse. And so in that diverse landscape, uh, in this chapter, we're just doing two different types of sort of integrating these different systems um, into uh, what we term platform ecosystems or into ecosystems of platforms. And the first one is uh, the the uh, a strategy of uh, or uh, of in, what we call interoperability. So interoperability is aimed at facilitating open connections uh, between a variety of platforms and data flows. Um, whilst the second one uh, we termed interoperability, so focused on connections within a particular system, is aimed at promoting stacks of vertically integrated proprietary platforms. So the second one is sort of the big tech one. And the first one is the effort of the Dutch public sector at building an open, independent digital education ecosystem. And so we'll now first uh, briefly talk about the first one, interoperability, what we described in the chapter as networking under public control. Um, so designing interoperability under public control involves profound private public negotiations between publishers, suppliers, and Dutch software developers and some umbrella organizations which represent schools. And this concerted effort aimed at creating an open, modular, and decentralized network to sort of promote schools' control over data flows and the organization of digital learning. And this public-private cooperative took the lead in designing a comprehensive agreement to govern interoperability between all levels and types of educational platforms and applications to the benefit of public schools. Um, and the agreements were translated into uh, procurements for technical standards to facilitate connectivity between these different kinds of platforms. Um, so I want to give two examples of these, these uh, sort of interoperability standards, which have been developed in the Dutch context in the past few years. Uh, firstly, uh, the covenants led to the development of open data standards, which facilitate exchange of learning data between different platforms. So open data standards promote platform diversity. As a platform which abide to standards have market access, uh, which in results also strengthen schools control over the organization of their own learning environments. As the schools have more freedom to design their online spaces in accordance with their own pedagogical views. As so which gives them so more control over how they want to arrange their own online digital spaces. Uh, secondly, the covenant led to agreed upon rules about the use of pseudonyms to guarantee student privacy in aggregated data and about data minimization. 
Um, so the covenant uh, has subsequently been translated into a technical standard, which is visualized here. It's called the ACK ID in Dutch, uh, which facilitate the exchange of learning data and, and learning results between various sort of network digital learning platforms and online management systems, while protecting a student's identity from data mining. Um, so it gives schools more control over data flows. But on the other hand, um, we see sort of large international tech companies working according to a different logic of connectivity. And so all these large American tech companies, Google, Microsoft, refused to sign sort of the public-private agreements which were set in the Dutch uh, public education sector. Um, but simultaneously, they invested instead of building their own sort of more closed circuits of integrated digital platforms, services, and infrastructures, which are sort of stacked on top of each other, uh, and which are all represented by a kind of seamless connectivity. And here you see a, 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 an image of the Google ecosystem. You could just as say uh, talk about sort of Microsoft or Apple's ecosystem, but it consists of sort of hardware devices, like in this case Chromebooks, which are seamlessly connected to software system for Google Workspace for Education, Google Classroom, uh, but also uh, uh, increasingly to sort of infrastructural services like Google Cloud infrastructure and underpinning sort of AI infrastructure. And these, ec uh, these ecosystems promote interoperability, so these connections within uh, as their preferred mode of connecting services to each other, which results in very close kind of ecosystems for uh, digital education. So seamless connectivity enhances platform companies' control over data flows distributed for all these levels of their own proprietary ecosystems, including sort of cloud infrastructures. Um, and these interconnections and these data flows are, for instance, uh, managed by their own sort of proprietary authentication systems like Google Sign In, which invisibly links data flows to the back end um, um, uh, of, these, of, these, of these ecosystems. And this raises major concerns, uh, and while public discussions about combining data flows typically revolve around privacy and security, which are highly important issues, the concern raised here is one much more focused on data ownership and control, shifting from schools to platform providers. So, um, to round up a bit, um, one of the chapters focuses upon one of the sections focuses on platformization as challenging education as a public good. Um, so the Dutch public education sector has this effort really to work towards sort of an open, uh, transparent uh, education environment built around interoperability. But it is continuously contested by sort of the growing influence of big tech corporate platforms and the dependence schools have on these systems. Um, so this means that sort of the governance of a fundamental public sector in the Netherlands and its institutions is dependent on the standards and conditions set by major tech corporations and also about sort of uh, dependent on sort of their logics and market economic values. And this challenges the interest and values of online education as a common good as it severely impacts the sovereignty of schools to organize their own digital education. Uh, and I just mentioned two examples, which is about Firstly, control over data flows, but it's also about sort of having control about how you want to arrange your own online learning environment and how you want to build your ecosystem as a modular kind of construct, uh, which exists on very different kinds of platforms and applications. Um, so to arrive at a conclusion, as to strengthen the sovereignty of schools, uh, we need a form of, of, of governance from the public sector, at least in the Netherlands, that promotes interoperability across all levels of the platform ecosystem. And so not only about the top, the top level where applications exist, but also about increasingly about the level of infrastructure, uh, which is uh, in which which uh, big tech companies reign supreme, especially now with the development of sort of AI infrastructure underpinning sort of their digital education platforms. Um, what this means is that we need a better sort of coordination between on the one of what happens in the Netherlands at this local national level, have where public sector sort of struggles to work towards sort of an open digital education ecosystem, but also to the level, the supranational level and European level, uh, where we could sort of work together sort of to work towards a more common uh, uh, infrastructure uh, for the public good. 
So at the local and national level already mentioned, uh, already there's there's new efforts and there's new funding available sort of to secure sort of interoperability in, in a sort of a national ad tech landscape, uh, development of open data standards and different agreements between public and private stakeholders and how to create and build such an ad tech ecosystem. Um, but European cooperation is just as essential to extend interoperability sort of uh, to the supranational level. And promising, or in this case was, or maybe still is, I don't know, I'm not sure, uh, uh, was sort of European cloud project Gaia-X, I don't know if you ever heard of that. Uh, it was launched a couple of years ago in 2020 as a direct response sort of to sort of US and Chinese sort of cloud giants sort of taking over that market. And the, the, the idea was that sort of the architecture of Gaia-X would be based on to European policy rules, standards, and values, and which includes sort of openness and transparency, digital sovereignty and self-determination, and modularity and interoperability, which really link sort of with sort of the Dutch efforts to build sort of an open public digital education ecosystem. But currently, it's really unclear what the current status of the project is and the role that specifically US cloud companies like Google and Microsoft today play uh, in uh, the, the development of this particular project, um, because as what is uh, a couple, of, I think last year it became known that Google already had a, a large stake in uh, in providing infrastructural services for for Gaia X. So I'm sure there's still quite a long way to go uh, and to preserve sort of educational institutional digital sovereignty. But as we can see in the Netherlands, there's also many hopeful initiatives and in the importance of public sectors to really take a stance in the in working towards sort of an open. Uh, a, a autonomous and transparent digital education ecosystem. I thank you very much for listening. I will now end the slides. And I will give the floor to Crystal Ball. Wonderful. Thank you, Nils. That's fantastic. I highly appreciate that. It has been a very inspiring experience working with you, but also with the rest of the colleagues. And I'm, I'm very grateful as well, I have to say, from Romina and Daniel for organizing this event. We, we are delighted and, and very pleased. Um, it would have been nice to do it in face to face, but this is a very, very good uh, plan B for this conversation. So um, I love the conclusions because it leads me to, uh, to think that within the book, we have very, very interesting experiences of interoperability at the national level, which is the case of India with Diksha. So I think this book does a decent job in terms of um, bringing voices from different perspectives, right? Uh, combining what policymakers are doing, practitioners, scholars, but also this dialogue, as Alex was mentioning, between the global north and the global south, and combining uh, very severe criticisms and concerns, but also with the promises and opportunities. So I'll briefly, I'll divide my presentation, my brief presentation in two components, lessons learned and some of the implications for the future. Um, so I think the book, reflects that in the context of the pandemic, it was very clear that lots of education systems really lack of readiness. And the digital divide really remained persistent in many, many regions of the world, either with access to devices, platforms, plans, strategies, skills, or even electricity in some cases. Right? Uh, but also the world has moved very fast from uh, the, the moment we conclude this, this publication till today. Um, and I want to underscore that many of the lessons of this book really uh, are of tremendous use and value for uh, the discussions that are taking place today in the context of generative AI, which, which is hitting many, many of the headlines today in terms of how to uh, set rules and frameworks and institutional capacities for navigating an, an uncharted territory. Now, um, there is a series of challenges underscored by the book that I think are very important to highlight, at least at the very um, um, preliminary level. First, lack of data protection, uh, which is really expanding uh, challenges regarding data vulnerability, and there's not shortage of data extraction and monetization, in other words, selling user data or kids' data. To some extent, we are witnessing the transition from the ed tech to the ad tech, advertisement technologies. In other words, high data concentration produce high levels of asymmetry. So um, as well as risk, as many of the authors mentioned, data colonialism, which are data generated by everyone, but, 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 important, but 
harvest, process, and sold by a small number of players, generating significant digital disparities. So additionally, datafication or platformization of education can really enhance, uh, but also displace the role of teachers when the systems think or act on behalf of the educators. The following risk, I think, is the loss of institutional control. In an increasing dominance of big technologies, generates high level, serious levels of dependency, and to some extent, an equal relationship between the governments and the digital developers. There's a false claim here that we saw in the pandemic, but we saw today in the world of Gen AI, which is free access. The false claim of free access to tools and platforms usually end up in lock-in relationships, what is very hard to get away from. There's also include an emergence of new players like Amazon or Zoom or even OpenAI today, which only a few years ago were not in the education landscape. All these factors really lead to a commodification of education, which can increase potential inequalities, particularly with government, for those governments with weaker institutional capacities or with inefficient regulatory frameworks, or with limited understanding of how technology and the data of those technologies are being used for unexpected commercial purposes. So all that makes it evident that there's non-neutrality in the educational technology arrangements. There's a very delicate balance between public education and profit. As a synthesis of the lessons learned, we can highlight that we have to challenge, we have a series of challenges. In terms of the first order challenges, we remain to be the ones that have been for the last 10 years, particularly in the global south, in terms of access to devices, connectivity, mobiles, tools, platforms, uh, overall, as well, proficiencies and capacities are, are of tremendous, tremendous importance. But on the second level, we still have a lot of work to do in terms of institutional capacities, the appropriate regulatory frameworks, high quality qualified public officers, and the human resources that can ensure that these technologies are not only implemented, um, but also enforced in a good and effective way. Now, I know that today, Talking about all these things sounds like history in the context of ChatGPT and many of these things. But this is not a history book. It's a book that says a lot of how we can navigate now to address the implications of the future. So we cannot do a shortcut. There is not shortcut here. So there's a number of implications for the future that I think can be helpful, not for the analytical purpose only, but also to set structures and tools for the future. Let me summarize some of them. I think it's going to be very important to build institutional capacities for increasingly data intensive educations. Governments will be in a position to lead or develop or coordinate, to buy, rent or outsource these technologies. Certainly different countries will depend on different uh, arrangements given their con context. But it's crucial to revisit the institutional designs to understand the best structure to navigate. It can be within the public sector, outside of the public sector, different arrangements are going to be well explained in the book, but it's instrumental that these agencies, these units, these divisions ensure sustainability in the long run, autonomy, appropriate coordination with different stakeholders, and an effective procurement, which in many cases is the deal breaker for these arrangements. So additionally, governments will be in a critical position to enforce, support, and facilitate interoperability, as Neil was mentioning, between different systems, but in order to ensure that they have the control, which is not always the case. Strengthening governance and regulation with policies, but also strategies. It's not the same. Policies, strategies, and research and monitoring. Not only to ensure deployment and high quality implementation, but in many cases, to ensure that there's no deviation between what the policy is saying and what is happening in the classroom. But governments cannot work alone here. All these aspects should contribute to generate a government and education sector that are better prepared for the forthcoming disruptions. Because let's face it, there will be other disruptions. In the book, we talk about COVID, but there will be social unrest that will disrupt the education system in some cases. In other cases, it will be climate-related disruptions or other sanitary uh, disruptions that might come in the future. Second, and lastly, capacity building. In terms of capacity building, it's very important to develop capacities for the system to interact with the regulators and the other players. I was saying we cannot work in these solutions in isolation. There's so many different layers. That's why it's so critical to have high skilled, high, high skilled teams capable of addressing many of these transformations in a timely manner. That means 
to support practitioners, principals, and teachers. It's good to expect that teachers will improve, but that means that they will require additional support, time flexibility, and why not? A little bit of recognition. There is a significant challenge here in terms of opening the black boxes, developing digital skills, and today more called AI fluency to help make data-driven decisions, but also protecting themselves um, and the students from bias, misinformation, automation of inequality, and a number of privacy breaches. We have learned during this work that most of the countries are in a developing condition in terms of digital skills for education. So I think, as many of the authors of this book have highlighted, the opportunities of these technologies are endless. But it's also really important to keep in mind some of the greater risk, because we cannot embrace technology with a lack of critical position. Thank you. Let's back now uh, give the floor over to Romina. A lot, um, Cristobal and uh, Niels and um, Axel, for the really insightful presentation. I think you have given us a lot of food for thought. Um, and I would like to, um, I have made uh, various notes, but first I would like to open the floor to, to colleagues and uh, friends who are also joining the seminar from outside. So either raise your hands um, or you just come in and and put the question forward to the to the speakers Daniel are you monitoring the chat because I haven't had time to look at the chat so perhaps there's any questions there uh, yes so far nothing is coming from the from the chat I have a few questions <laughs> uh, but let's see if uh, our colleagues want to say uh, anything. Oh, Nicoletta, I, I think that Nicoletta has uh, her hand up. Yes, thanks a lot for, for the presentation. It's really interesting. It's really interesting to start looking uh, at an analysis of the different technologies used in schools. I wanted to jump in a little bit in the procurement process because that's um, you know, that's the thing that comes up, I think, more and more. And I was wondering if you have looked into centralized models or non-centralized models, like how do schools procure these technologies? And if there are some, um, you know, already in place, some methods of supporting them, um, do we know what kind of expertise the schools need in order to be able to um, uh, address the challenges that come with the um, integration of technologies and they are more related in what you mentioned, like, um, you know, privacy, data protection and things like this. Thank you. That's great. Should we wait for more questions or should we address that one? Go ahead and reply for now and until we wait for more questions. Wonderful. So thank you for the question. I, I believe that um, I have a colleague who said procurement is the topic that everybody loves to hate because it's not an appealing topic, but it's really, really a deal break, right? So the procurement is the moment when the, the arrangements are made. And one of the concerns I have is in many cases, we don't do a good job transferring expertise from country A to country B in terms of how to do a good procurement. Right? So institutional capacities needs to be developed here and, and learn good lessons. I, I, what, Regardless of the question whether it's a centralized or decentralized approach, uh, we have completely different flavors in different countries. Uh, let me highlight two completely different flavors in South America. For instance, in the case of Uruguay that Axel was mentioning, there's one entity that designed and defined the technologies for the whole country, right? Which is the case of Uruguay. Um, while a neighbor country in Chile, the approach is slightly different which is the, the resources are being transferred at the school level and the school will be the one in charge of choosing what technology will be used there, right? So it's very interesting because it's a much more, much more bottom-up approach, but you have addressing many of the challenges that we have been highlighted, uh, Niels and Axel. We have a big challenge that, to ask ourselves, are the principals at the school level with the technical knowledge to face these gigantic vendors in many cases with very asymmetric relationships, that's a big problem. So 
whether it's centralized or decentralized, the key component here will be to ensure that there's transparency in the existing procurement system that we have today, to be sure that new governments won't follow on the mistakes made in the past. I think that's going to be very, very instrumental, but I'm sure my colleagues can explain. And before that, maybe I jump in because that's that's quite interesting. We are running a study on, on digital well-being in, in, in education. And of course, we need to touch upon this issue of, of procurement and what we've seen in, in Europe is that there are mixed systems sometimes, like either top down, bottom up or mixed, like for some technologies is the centralized, like, you know, what they do with um, platforms for admin data or for teleconference and things like this. And for sh short, smaller things, they go uh, they give their responsibility to schools, but what um, I was wondering here, and it's an additional thing, and certainly I, I hope I don't monopolize the discussion, but just a final note, is that there are third players emerging, and these third players can be just a company who is an intermediary, and they play the role of screening at some point uh, between the companies and the schools, or there are uh, organizations put in place by the ministry. So they, they put in place an organization who helps the schools. So um, again, this is a transfer of power. And when you're speaking about institutional building institutional capacity, um, I wonder like, do you refer the school? And what does this mean? And like with all these third players, again, do we transfer power? Again, somebody else comes in place. It's not the big company, the big tech, but somebody else who is in the intermediary. And, Again, the problem is not solved, so I wonder like, if you have any reflections on this. Maybe I can say, say, uh, say a bit about the Dutch context when it comes to these kinds of intermediaries, right? Which, uh, which is for them for primary education. So primary education Netherlands is, is uh, in procurement of, for ICT, it's represented by sort of cooperative organizations, which represents sort of all Dutch primary schools, in uh, also in procurement process when it comes to procurement of, for instance, a Google workspace or a Microsoft Teams for education, like the, the bigger systems, which 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 more money is, is is involved. And I think this sort of cooperative organization works really well. So they're represented by a particular board, which exists of representatives of Dutch school organizations, which together are organized to actually facilitate and help schools in these very difficult procurement processes and also to weigh in sort of their interests and values, which is still, there's still a long way to go as well. Maybe another example I can give, which is not in primary education, but at the university level in the Netherlands is at Utrecht University, we're now in the process of procuring a new learning management system, which is sort of the beating heart of the digital education system of, of university, right? So it's a big thing. And this is for the first time that we have asked, or the Utrecht University has asked some of the in the procurement process, some of the potential providers like Blackboard or Canvas, they ask them to also write a reflection on public values which are fundamental to the Dutch education system, where there's like autonomy, uh, humanity, justice, some of these values, and we've asked them to reflect upon that. I don't know if that's the best way to go, but I've read, I've, 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 uh, I've read a couple of these statements for the providers, and then you can compare. They're very different in how they sort of tackle these issues. And then you can compare and contrast if it's actually sort of an honest kind of approach to, to do something about it, or like it's more sort of commercial marketing kind of approach. But I, I thought it was an interesting kind of, well, way forward in procurement. So, Maybe I yes. can uh, jump in here. Hey. Hi, everybody. My name is uh, Rina Porekare. I used to work with uh, many of you guys at the JRC, so familiar faces, and also uh, Christopher from the World Bank. Um, just uh, like that capacity building, and I'm glad, Niels, you gave that example from uh, the Netherlands, because that's uh, something that we've been looking a lot ab about. The Netherlands, like the way the procurement, uh, you kind of like a build a buffer zone between the schools, for example, and the tech companies. Or when it was the, you know, getting the internet connection to the schools, like uh, 10, 15 years, well, 15, 20 years ago, there was Kenny's Net who was there, kind of a go between helping and advising, kind of a, a public body, but advising schools on this. And this is exactly like a, 
each school can't have that kind of capacity. You know, they, they get stolen, like good network guys get stolen to industry because it pays so much more. That's always been the same story. And uh, also the small countries have that problem, you know, exactly the same problem. Uh, people in the ministries are not necessarily the experts on these things. They have to deal with procurement and so, so. Uh, another interesting country is France where um, they, put a lot of at the Ministry of Education, they put a lot of thinking into procurement process of uh, digital uh, textbooks or digital learning materials, and kind of also building a buffer between the, the data flow, let's go, say like a, what kind of usage data goes from um, children in the classroom who use these learning materials back to the uh, producer of this uh, um, content so that there is uh, kind of some controls in the place so that it doesn't, get entirely exploited, but at the same time, the, the school book or textbook publishers get the right information from, from the usage, because that's also important. You need that kind of the feedback loop there. So I didn't actually have any question for you. It's more of a comment, but um, that um, I think that's the asymmetry in a way, like uh, you have lots of schools who don't have a lot of knowledge. They are buying something either themselves directly or the ministry on behalf of them and uh, the big tech companies just get get there and get their way and um, it's nice that um, this topic is now being brought up I think the the um, pandemic was exactly the time that we uh, kind of were rewoken by the situation it was there for a long time but there it really just uh, you know, made made it clear. So, um, but how to go forward on it and what would be the best ways to address this issue in the future is hard because you do want to keep that, you know, the kind of the actors that the, the you know, the schools are actors in the game. Uh, you kind of want to keep that, but you don't want to load them too much. So um, it is a delicate balance, but I'm very, very pleased to hear from the Netherlands and uh, CLAT that you shared shared this uh, thing, and I'll be interested in reading the book a little bit later. Then, thank you. Let me add just one comment to what Bina was saying, and, and, and the, the the conversation, the flow of the conversation. And I think that it's very interesting to 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 hear examples from different models, and and to think about these models if this the approach is top down or 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 more uh, autonomy from from the schools and the teachers but i think that it's key to understand that in many countries particularly in, in the developing wor world there are no agencies whatsoever so we have no uh, bridges uh, in some cases uh, the state has some some agency or sort some some sort of uh, supply of educational technology but it's very discontinuous and and fragile uh, and and it's not really doing the work uh, at any sort of uh, model so first of all i think we need the to create the capacity at the state level the agency capacity and we can use a, a, a more top-down approach or a more balanced approach with lots of partners from the private sector and experts who curate the uh, content to give schools some sort of information about what they are consuming. But in any case, it's key to develop these capacities because the world keeps on marching on and and schools have to to use resources and there are many new uh, layers and, and platforms in this ecosystem that could work and we need to put some uh, state capacity to uh, build the bridge and to make the translation process to from the private mar market to the public sector and, and to convert the commodities into uh, a public good. So that's a very sophisticated process which needs very 
European technical abilities and a political view of why you are doing that and in what direction are you going? Thanks a lot, Axel and Rina. Uh, we also have a question in the chat. Uh, Ashley Etemadi, you want to come in perhaps to put the, the question forward or shall we read it? Hi, yeah, we can read it. Um, it was more a question around capacity building in this new age. Uh, I know Cristobal spoke about um, AI literacy and just digital literacy in general. And I'm curious, kind of what do we see as the greatest barriers to getting the necessary groups up to speed, whether it be educators, uh, other practitioners, people in industry learning about how learning works. I think I've seen that a lot where, you know, there's this big divide between the education sector and what we are talking about as kind of the private sector or the, the commercial sector um, where uh, there's kind of a, not a full understanding of how education works. And so I'm curious kind of in this new age, what are kind of the skills that need to be developed across the board for people to be able to speak to each other, but also for us to get learners up to speed on the skills that are necessary? That's a great question. And I'll invite my, my, my fellow colleagues to, to help me on this, but I, I think that's essential, right? The, and I like that you put in the question, the word new, because, um, New is a very subtle concept, right? Elements are not new. Now, GPT is the new thing. So that really sometimes hijack the policies, just focus on what is the cutting edge. And so um, many of the decisions of how and what technology to implement into the education system is either vendor driven, uh, evidence driven, or excitement driven, right? And usually it's very difficult to compile and align all these different factors because usually don't, they don't talk to each other. The, the excitement and the evidence usually come a very different path. And if I'm wrong, Niels, let me let me know. So I think many of the problems are not on the tools, but much more on this change in the system level. Um, and that requires time, consistency, and, and not necessarily techie capacities, but lack of understanding of the long-term transformations that are not um, attached to a specific technology. So the EdTech Hub, uh, which is this research um, cluster in the UK, they offer a very simple approach that I think distills some of the skills that you are, uh, you are asking. Um, this approach is called the six Ps. People, products, pedagogy, policy, place, and provision. Provision is a uh, um, procurement. So with this, each one of these six P's, we can un unpack the specific skills that will be attached. And just to finish, um, I'm here an interesting discussion more and more of the need of having a, some kind of FDA, the Food and Drug Administration Agency that exists in the U.S. that some of you might fam be familiar with, for the tech sector. Meaning having an entity that curate with the basics in terms of evidence, quality of data, reliability, et cetera, um, on the high quality of tools to at least endorse or promote some among others. Uh, that's an option, right? But also is um, it might end up in a very um, authoritarian approach in which one decide for the rest what can be done. But what is certain is we need to better consolidate uh, these policies not only by the excitement driven, which in many cases is what uh, hit all the headlines. Many thanks, Cristobal. Um, there is a question now by Daniel. Yes, thank you, Romina. I have a question for Niels. Um, I was wondering if you could say a few words about the, the impact you think GDPR had in the in the way the um, platformization of education has uh, evolved in in the Netherlands, where you think it had an impact, or or if you could say a little bit about uh, you think the, the role it played. 
Uh, yeah, uh, thank you for the question. It's an important question. It definitely had an impact in, in the Netherlands or at, at sort of the local level of schools, uh, but also at the, the national level of Dutch developers of educational technologies, which had to abide to uh, new privacy laws. Uh, and there was an agreement made between schools uh, supported by government and sort of these public cooperatives uh, involving uh, as well as the private stakeholders, so developers of Dutch educational technologies and platforms and applications, uh, which is called the, the the Privacy Covenant, in which they sort of set a different made different kinds of agreements on uh, on data processing within sort of these systems provided by uh, by national developers, all based on GDPR regulation. Uh, but then sort of contextualized within the Dutch primary education uh, sector context. Um, but there's, a, there's a, a different, very interesting case. Maybe most of you have heard of that uh, as, as it was reported on in the New York Times last year. So uh, a couple of years ago in 2021, there was a big uh, data protection impact assessment on Google Workspace for education uh, conducted by several Dutch cooperatives, uh, CIFON, Kennisnet, and CERF, uh, supported by the Dutch Ministry uh, for Education. Uh, and it was conducted by a Dutch organization called the, the Privacy Company. Uh, and, and the, the PI reported some high privacy risks in the use of uh, Google Education uh, in, in the Netherlands. Um, and uh, these organizations in the subsequent years used uh, the uh, the data protection impact assessment, which is actually an impact assessment on European privacy law, right? Uh, in relation to the system, they use that as a leverage to negotiate uh, and, and uh, to negotiate with uh, with Google and also with Zoom for higher education. Um, and these negotiation process were actually quite successful uh, in what they achieved in terms of new agreements made with Google on uh, transparency, building transparency tools into their products, and also an important shift because Google thought it was actually sort of the controller of several data flows uh, originating in Dutch schools towards this sort of ecosystem, whilst privacy law told us that Google was only the controller and schools were sort of, uh, Google, Google was only the processor and Dutch schools were actually sort of the controlling party there. Uh, and so now they also developed a new version of uh, 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 the Chrome OS uh, for Chromebooks, in which schools are actually sort of the, the controller, and it's called the processor version, and Google is the processor of that educational data. Uh, it was reported on in World Times. There's an interesting title. It's called How the Netherlands is Taming Big Tech. This was uh, written by Natasha Singer. <laughs> I don't know if that's the right title here, but it, it, it tells something about sort of steps that are being taken also and the importance of GDPR regulation as a leverage for these Dutch cooperatives to actually, as a small country, to negotiate something with a big tech companies such as Google, because in the process, Google started to realize that it's not only the Netherlands they were sort of negotiating with, but actually all these other, firstly, European uh, countries, which have sort of European privacy law implemented, uh, which could then have maybe the same effect that schools would maybe stop using sort of Google products in, in education, as you now already see for, in cases in Denmark and, and in Sweden. So yes. It was a highly important uh, step uh, in the Netherlands. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Um, perhaps I can take the advantage that there is no <laughs> hands raised to ask a question myself. Um, very related to what you were just discussing now. Um, because I, I've also noticed that uh, many parents feel very confused now on whether the, the data of their students, of their children are, are being used um, for whatsoever, you know. Um, and sometimes you had situations, I mean, we found this in the data when we, when we were doing the study on COVID, that some parents were actually refusing that their children participate in in some um, some type of activity in the that was being used at the time uh, remotely uh, because it was using a specific technology, and I was wondering if you found any of these examples because some students could even be left out because the parents decide that they don't want to conform, for example, uh, to the data protection um, of a specific technology. Is that a question for me, Romina? Or whoever wants to answer. 
I can briefly answer. Like in the Netherlands, I, I didn't see any sort of parents sort of, sort of taking uh, resistance against sort of big tech dominance or uh, against sort of data sort of being sort of taken from the primary school students. Um, but there is an interesting Swedish case I know that has been reported on, uh, in which parents actually stood up and tried to develop sort of their own sort of open source kind of system in relation to sort of um, uh, to I think one of the uh, dominant sort of uh, American uh, providers of, of, of uh, applications for schools. I, I'm not sure. It was reported on by Wired magazine. It's a highly interesting case actually because I think. Um, it was actually sort of the, that initiative was eventually shut down uh, and because all kinds of, I don't know exactly sort of the details of the case, but for me, there's a the highly interesting kind of, kind of thing. And in the Netherlands, I don't see that kind of resistance taking sort of parents sort of actually being, yeah, take, taking the, seeing that as much of an issue. So resistance doesn't come so much from parents as it does come from schools and cooperatives uh, themselves. Thank you. Um, anybody else? Uh, we are at five, so if we have no more questions. Perhaps we can round up. So Danielle has put in the chat the wired story, and perhaps if any of you can put also in the chat the the other the other news um, uh, that you mentioned, uh, Niels, before uh, I think it was published in the New York Times uh, about Google. Uh, so perhaps people can access it as well. So um, I just want to say many thanks uh, to um, to the speakers for for your time and also for the rich discussion. Um, also to my colleague Daniel Villar on Rubia, who has organized the seminar together with uh, the lead seminar colleagues Alice and Guillaume. So thanks a lot, everybody, and thanks for for the Maybe, audience for joining. Yeah. Alicia, thank, yeah. thank you, Romina. Sorry, just to remind to all the participants that the next uh, um, se uh, seminar, let seminar, would be in March, the, the 13th of March, and it would be about uh, digital monitoring in a workplace. So uh, I hope you to see you next month for another interesting discussion. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye.